new highs for Bitcoin, I believe. They, they tagged it and went back. So we want to, obviously on the agenda today, we got heavy duty crypto talk. We want to talk about top trades in crypto, what we're seeing, Bitcoin, ETF, miners. There's all kinds of crazy action going on. Um, and we've got our man on the scene, the man with the charts, Greg Guntner here. Gunner, good morning. You, you're you watching all this action. Any uh, any excitement for today? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot happening. I really do think this is the beginning of some type of a rotation trade, which I believe we'll get into a little bit later. But yeah, Bitcoin, new all-time highs. And, you know, I feel like this is the start of another ramp right here. Obviously, it's been going up for some time. You know, just at the beginning of February, it was, what, 40K? And now we're up uh, in the high 60s. And it feels like everybody has six figures uh, on their mind right now. And 100K is is the big target that everybody's going to be watching. So we'll see if it can continue to ramp and get up there. Yep. Yeah, you and I are on the same page and um, chat's open. So if you got thoughts on Bitcoin, cryptos or anything else we talked about, go ahead, write it in there, say hi, if you like, add some comments. Um, but you and I are on the same page. It just feels like this is nowhere near a topping out. Like a lot of times you might say, oh, we're going to tag those highs and then we'll just sit around there. It just doesn't feel like that in crypto. Um, it feels like there's so much narrative for these big, big numbers um, coming up on the halving and all these things with Bitcoin and just the the action we've seen so far seems pretty explosive. So I think we're going to see more, more updates than not um, heading in the next few weeks. So we'll see what happens and we'll break it all down for you. The other stuff that we'll cover later in the call are some of the other rotation plays. We're seeing some big stuff. And Gunnar, you've been ahead of this. The Mag7, you were talking about it, the Apples, the Googles. Um, we joke around in the office here about calling them the lag seven, like they're going to start lagging behind. And that has now happened. Like we're starting to see some down days for those big stocks. People are rotating elsewhere. Um, and then two other big topics that we've been covering that we want to cover too. Gold, we're at all time highs there as well. And energy is starting to perk up a little bit. So we're going to cover as much as we can. Top trades, lots of tickers. But first and foremost, we're going into the world of crypto, top crypto trades. So, Gunnar, do you want to break us down? Do you want to share a chart? I mean, Bitcoin off the charts, Ethereum off the charts, things are going. I mean, we can see where, where we've been heading. And it's been a very sharp rally. That's very typical of crypto, obviously. I saw there was a comment um, in the chat that said, uh, where is it? Right in the middle of chat right here. Yeah, Bitcoin will pull back before hitting six figures. Absolutely. I don't think we're just going to go straight, straight up and magically tack on $40,000 of Bitcoin. I think it could be fast. But at the same time, these parabolic moves are going to have those big, big resets that we see. We're going to get some big red candles in there. Uh, one of the things that you can always bet on in the markets is that it's not going to be easy. Whenever it starts to feel easy, whenever things, whenever things start to you know, feel like they're going perfectly all the time, that's when the market tends to shake things up. The market's main job is to reach its hands in your pocket and remove that money. Uh, so we always have to keep that in mind. So whenever we're feeling a little bit too confident one way or the other, the market's always there to kind of knock us back to reality. And I think we're going to get a couple, three of those moments within this major rally. Um, it's been pretty easy so far since we had all of this, uh, all of this mess surrounding the ETF approvals. That's when things were a little bit more difficult. And I know it's, it's tough to put ourselves back into that mindset since things are going so well now. For crypto and it feels like it's just going straight up but you know just at the beginning of 2024 we had the issue where everyone was really excited about the bitcoin etfs getting approved and they tried to push up bitcoin up to 50k it failed completely lost a quick ten thousand dollars there so anybody that was late and got caught up in that mess right there might have ended up buying at the top of this range and then selling at the bottom right before it rips higher so again i think that's just another instance of the market keeping us honest um, and making it not super easy just to ride these trends. You're going to have to white knuckle some of these moves higher in Bitcoin. Now, if we zoom out, and I've been annotating this chart for um, uh, for some folks in our chat right here, because we were talking about these, these different Bitcoin cycles that we've been in, and I've been highlighting the resistance levels um, in these major downtrends that we we were seeing in Bitcoin over the past uh, several years or so here. This, is, this Bitcoin chart here only goes back to that big 2017 run, but you can see the deflation that comes after these big, huge runs higher and then the moves back lower to the total reset here. 
uh, that took place in the two years following that uh, Q4 2017 romp all the way to new all-time highs, back when we thought 17K was ridiculously high for Bitcoin. And then we had another uh, push right here that never made it to those highs. And it took another year and a half or so for that to deflate. Then the super big COVID push right here, which we all remember, and then kind of a false breakout higher here uh, in November 21 right at the start of what turned out to be a pretty nasty bear market um, that's lasted the past couple of years here in 2021 into 2022 and early part of 2023. And then the, the sort of janky breakout that we get, and now we're really starting to ramp higher here. And you can see how it's starting to hockey stick. And then we have the new all-time highs here, just barely creeping up and getting above those all-time highs um, from what was it? I guess, mid-November 2021, when Bitcoin was uh, attempting to break out there. I think that that has been enough time now. I think we've had enough digestion. We've had a big enough reset there where uh, this could easily go higher from here. Maybe there'll be some consolidation. We see Bitcoin's down a little bit today, but I mean, just compared to the move that it's made over the past couple of weeks, when it's gone from 43 to 66, I think that we could give it some slack here and maybe even eat into this and totally reset down here into the 50s before going higher. But we see it all trickling down. We see it trickling down into the stock market, uh, into the crypto-related stocks. We see it trickling down into the smaller coins. I know you and I, Matt, have talked a lot about how some of these meme coins and Doge coins and all the other stuff are popping. I don't really follow them that closely, but everybody's chatting about them online. Uh, all the crypto traders are back. The crypto prognosticators are back on TikTok, making their big predictions about, uh, you know, the moons and stars aligning for crypto. So it's it's getting frothy. It's it's we're 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 back. We're back in a big crypto bull market right now. Yeah, you got to watch out if you're on TikTok or YouTube or anywhere, and you click on one of those videos. And I don't mean like a promotional video, just a regular video. Then all of a sudden, the algorithm says, "Oh, this guy wants to know more about crypto." I did that the other day and I just got, it was like crypto video, crypto video of having, having new price targets, uh, little coins you need to buy. Um, so the the pump and the the narrative, which we talk about this all the time. Again, it's, it's, this is a little bit deeper than my normal fundamental hat, but like the narrative that controls these things is very, very important. And the narrative is just getting underway and all yeah. the people are coming out of the woodwork. So like Gunnar's saying, we could see some, stuff here right we just hit an all-time high this morning it's already pulling back three thousand dollars um so we're going to see a little bit of volatility but the that big narrative of oh man this thing could go to 150 200 000, like all that stuff will it get there who knows but could it easily tag 100 yes and i think that would be in the next 30 days so like you might get some red candles then all of a sudden the rocket comes back out so we'll see what happens again it's all kind of guesswork here but um, Gunnar, why don't we bring up another chart? Do you have Ethereum? Can we bring that up just to see if that's any, yeah. uh, any I think, different. I, think I know. Ethereum, and and I I think I said this last week. I think Ethereum might be the catch up trade in all of yeah. this because I mean, obviously you have like the, the the much smaller penny cryptos or whatever you want to call them, altcoins. You see them just sort of you know shoot straight up um, and produce like doubles and triples within a day and stuff like that. I mean, if you're day trading them, I guess that makes sense. I don't really look at that stuff, but. Yeah. Ethereum, obviously Bitcoin's little brother, um, has a lot of good utility, but still well off um, those all-time highs, which are closer to 5K up here. And it's only at 3,700, um, you know, with Bitcoin. Yeah, what is that, that? Like a 40% move? Well, that's just it. Like Ethereum's been lagging. Um, it just recently really started to ramp and you can see this parabolic move right here. I, I think it's entirely possible that if Bitcoin slows down, um, you know, Ethereum sort of takes, you know, control of the driver's seat. And again, all of it comes back to rotation. And in any type of bull cycle, whether you're dealing with crypto, whether you're dealing with the stock market, you're going to have these periods where you have these big, big winners that people see and they want to play. And then when the momentum starts to wane in those big winners, that hot money is looking for somewhere else to go. And it usually trickles down into more speculative names because they say, okay, I've got a little bit of confidence now. I know this trend is working. I know crypto is moving higher. I made a bunch of money on Bitcoin. Now I'm going to try my shot at Ethereum. Now I'm going to try my shot at Dogecoin. Now I'm going to try, you know, playing this. And that's when you get this rotation into these other plays. Ethereum, again, it's a major player. This isn't like something that, you know, you have to worry about. Like, I don't think like, you know, totally fizzling out. Um, 
I think it's going to be around for a while. And a lot of people have a lot of good things to say about it. Again, I'm not a big fundamental crypto guy, but I do think that a catch up trade with Ethereum trying to catch those all time highs and maybe outpacing Bitcoin in the short term, I think that makes a lot of sense. If you see that start happening, I think that's a good trade right there. But again, I think it's important to note too that this thing's been going straight up for a while. There are going to be those gut check days. Uh, and it's going to feel bad if you're holding on to these things and yeah. they're down 10, 15, 20% in a day. I think that that chart looks like it can shed $700 in. Yeah. And not even, two, and not two even days. It. it won't even yeah. blink because I mean, again, you know, a month ago on February 5th, it was at 2,200 bucks. So we're, it's March 5th today. Yeah. That's quite the move right there from those lows. And it really hasn't tested the bulls. And by that, I mean, we don't have any really big red candles here where anybody would be feeling extra nervous about holding yeah. on to their position right there. We're already seeing uh, bulls get tested uh, on the equity side of things with, uh, you know, these crypto miners right here. Bitcoin and Ethereum are going straight up. Mara is not. Um, this stock yeah. has, is down three of the past four sessions, and it's down pretty big, uh, down 16 percent uh, to finish up last week. And then on Monday, down another five. And then today, down 12. Yeah, same thing with Clean Spark. We've been talking about that one for weeks. I still have exposure to Clean Spark. I've sold some of it um, yesterday. I think it was lightening up a little bit last week. So it's uh, they, it started to burn me. And I don't like that when I'm talking a trading stock. Um, so there's something going on here too. If you guys have any thoughts, again, write in some comments. There is clearly a disconnect. You can see it as plain as day in the charts. Bitcoin and Ethereum are sky and high. Uh, miners are getting that very harsh you know, decoupling, and they're not they're not doing what um, we want them to be doing. If we're trying to trade, uh, if if I would have closed my eyes, I'll say it in a different way. But I closed my eyes and woke up, and someone said, "Hey, Bitcoin's at all time highs, sixty nine. You know, this morning, what is Clean Spark at?" And you would have asked me that two weeks ago, I would be like, oh, Clean Spark's probably like 30 bucks. And it was, it was at 16. Like it just did not respond. There's something going on and it might be in the narrative. It might be, maybe the miners aren't the place to be. Maybe people want the real coins. Maybe the ETFs are starting to take some of the buyers away. Gunnar, any thoughts on that or anybody in the, anyone in the chat, if you want to write in some, some thoughts, if you got, um, you know, what you think is going on in this minor action, because it's, it's well, nasty compared to the, the coins. I mean, I think it could just be a, the situation where there's profit taking, uh, there's money on the table and people are taking it off. Um, I think it could be a situation where the narrative is changing, like you said, and people are concerned about the halving and how miners are going to perform post halving. And maybe they're maybe they're moving out of something else. I have MicroStrategy, which I, you know, we should treat as like a Bitcoin holding company, I guess, uh, up on the screen right now. And it was streaking higher yesterday along with Bitcoin. It was up, what, 20 some percent? Yeah, it was up yeah. 23% yesterday. Today, it's down 15. I mean, maybe this is just a hard reset for this as well because Bitcoin is slowing down a little bit. Oh, wait, we got Bitcoin dropping right now before our very eyes. Ah, Bitcoin's down 4% today. Like I said, yeah. this these moves happen quick. Um, and maybe because we're talking it up, it's moving down right now. That's how the market tends to react, right? Well, it tagged, it tagged an all-time high. That's a good point when everyone's like, oh, let's just step out for a right, little bit. Right, exactly. Whatever, you but... have, you're going to have profit taking. And that happens a lot in the major averages too. You'll you'll have the major averages coming off of a off of a bear market and they'll be back to those all-time highs. And they'll kind of there'll kind of be this little battle between the bulls and the bears. Maybe it'll be, uh, you know, uh, like a high and tight consolidation right there. Maybe it needs to retreat and sort of give us a cup and handle. Uh, so you never know like what kind of action you're going to get. Yes, it, and someone in, in the chat said it's all my fault. It is all my fault. That's what happens when you talk good about something. It goes down. Yeah. Uh, that's how the, the market's always listening. Um, but yeah, so this is the type of action we should expect. Again, it's not going to be smooth sailing. If we do, if everyone's minds are tuned in, like I think they might be to 100K, it's going to be a crazy ride. But you know, you're going you're going to get sucked into it at the wrong time and all the other, and, you know, and you're going to end up, buying on those big green candles and then you're going to get a big red candle thrown in your face i guarantee you there was people chasing bitcoin yesterday why wouldn't you you know yeah. up pile in end of the day pile in and then you start thinking it's going to go to 75 and beyond and right just... you start you, your mind starts spinning you start dreaming about all those big numbers and you start chasing and that's that's the fomo that's exactly what happens that's the fear of missing out we're in a fomo driven market right now there's no doubt about it all the fomo related to the semiconductors, big tech, 
all the stuff that has been pushing this market higher, there's no price people won't pay for it at the moment. Now, yeah. when things cool off, they're going to they're gonna come to their senses and they're going to start saying, oh, I don't know, am I paying too much for this? They're going to start thinking about it a little bit more. But right now, the only thinking is other people are making money and I'm not. So let's jump in and see how high this thing will go. So yeah. that's I think that's the mindset that we're dealing with right now in this market. And I think it's going to change pretty quickly if this rotation continues to spin the way I think it's going to, because we've already seen the pieces of this puzzle start to come into focus. Way back in December, I was talking about a potential rotation at the beginning of 2024. I was wrong because all those stocks, the bag sevens, the semis, all the big winners from the melt-up rally kept on going while the rest of the market kind of got reset in January. But now you can see the action today and you can see the action from yesterday. If we look at the big mag seven stocks, we can see Apple breaking down. We can see Google breaking down. This is a pretty significant breakdown for a very big company here. Uh, oh, look at that. Apple uh, Apple is a, is a small fruit producer. I, I don't know if you've heard of this uh, stock right here, but it's a pretty it's a pretty important stock in the market. And you can see here these these magic lines that we drew. I, I was talking about a potential breakdown of 180 last week. I was thinking about shorting this thing in some way or another, oh. but it seemed like the market was just bouncing, bouncing, bouncing every single time. And then look at that, look how quickly it, it lost those levels. And yesterday down two and a half percent, today down another two and a half percent. That's a nice 5% move lower toward 170 for Apple toward the bottom of its range here. It's trading back near its October lows. It's given back all of the melt up now. Uh, that's pretty incredible for a, a stock like this. And I think there's, you know, you can argue fundamental reasons uh, about Apple right now, um, issues with, uh, you know, there was some sort of antitrust thing. I think somebody mentioned that in the chat. Yeah. There was, there's other fundamental, but regardless of all of that, the price action is telling us, has been telling us to stay away on the long side from a name like this. There have been other Mag7 names that have been much stronger. If we look at something like Microsoft, uh, but it too is starting to roll over a little bit. It's down two and a half percent today. And they're really bullying the averages here. And you can see the how far the NASDAQ has sunk. So far today, the Nasdaq down, you know, 1.7%, sort of dragging everything else down along with it. Look at the heat map. All this is tech over here. And you can see how badly software is getting dinged up. This is the stuff folks were chasing. And now it's enduring a bit of a hard reset. And we're going to have to sift through the rubble and see what's still surviving from here. Again, I think all of this is healthy. I don't think this says, hey, we're heading for a big crash. I don't think there's anything to be super concerned about. However, we're well beyond the time of year where the stock market should be slowing down a little bit. This is an election year. Typically, the seasonality for an election year is your gains are very much backloaded. After a pretty strong February, you're going to see stocks level off and maybe go down a little bit into the summer months. And then toward the election, November, December is where you see the gains typically pile on to push toward the end of the year. We're in the weakest six months of the year right now. Seasonally, the market should be chilling out, should be getting choppier. We should be able to see some new trends emerging. So I think we've, we're starting to see the beginnings of that with small caps perking up, with biotech perking up, with gold breaking out. Yes, everybody watching Bitcoin, but gold is also breaking out here and pushing toward all-time highs. Silver's looking better. Are the gold miners going to wake up? I think there's a lot of interesting trades away from this stuff that's gone parabolic lately that we need to be focusing on and shifting our attention to in the coming months. Gunner, if I can, I'm going to have you go back in time a little bit, and the answer could be no here, or it could be wait and see. But if we wanted to say, hey, this is cryptos going parabolic, we're talking top trades. Is there a trade, not an official trade, is there a trade, are there any tickers that you like? I know you showed micro strategy. Is there anything that you'd be saying if, if, if Bitcoin does go, you know, it can rattle around the next few days, but if it goes towards 100 in, say, the next 30 days, is there a trader that you like there? Um, I like Ethereum. I know that's kind of off the beaten path for me since I'm an equities guy, but I do think that if and when we do get a harder consolidation, that Ethereum is a buy the dips type of trade in this market. Um, I think Bitcoin on the dips is a good trade if you can kind of avoid the FOMO and mm -hmm. grab onto it. I think that this is the type of environment right now where you want to, if you've been 
sitting on some smaller coins and, or you've been trying to trade some of those smaller coins, my strategy would be take the gains from those big runs out of those smaller coins and start pushing them up the market cap scale up toward Bitcoin and Ethereum and put the money back into the bigger stuff. Uh, because I think we're just in a frothy period right now. And I think that will will probably dissipate a little bit and some of those gains might go away. But I think that we'll still see Bitcoin and Ethereum push up. And I think the Ethereum catch-up trade makes a lot of sense. I don't yes. yet know. I don't yet know if um if these are gonna catch these these crypto miners, but I don't think they're terrible trades on a bounce. I wouldn't buy them on dips because I think it's catching a falling knife. And if we go back in time here and we look at this, buying the dips doesn't work. Buy the bounce after the dip. That's a much better strategy. Like see if it's going to firm up a little bit and maybe try to buy one of these bounces in here. You know, it might not work immediately, uh, but I think you have a much better chance of your trade working out if you wait for this thing to settle somewhere. Maybe it needs to retreat all the way back here into the 12s. Maybe it's going to catch up here and bounce. I don't know. But buying a big green candle after a downtrend like this makes a lot of sense to me. It'll get you a good entry point. I think it's a much better trade than trying to chase it on the way up on these big gaps where it's gapping up 30% or so like it did after earnings right there. Um, and again, I don't know if the fundamental ideas are correct. I don't know if these stocks are going to get dinged up really badly after the halving, these, these Bitcoin miners. Uh, that could be bunk. They could do just fine. But I think if we follow the price action, it's going to lead us in the right direction here. And so buying these on the bounce, buying crypto on the dips, I think that makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. uh, to me as far as like good crypto trading heading into the second quarter. Yeah. And I would, I mean, I'd probably play a little devil's advocate and, and that's what we like here at Top Trades and me and Gunnar are different people. And there is a there is a concept, right? Like you could say right now, move out of those small coins into up into the higher market cap, Bitcoin, Ethereum. I think there's an alt angle there where you've got time that these things might just be warming up. Again, you look at some of those little turd coins that have just been going uh, ballistic. Like, Gunnar, you've taught me this. So I'm playing devil's advocate, but I'm using some of your logic. So I don't know. I'm, I'm combining some different things here. But there is a time to be a little bit dumb in the market. Sure. Now might be that time that like you sit in some of those coins that just have some narrative that uh, I saw it in the chat, like you look at the coins that have the use cases and whatever, because once some of those start gaining steam, you get these little momentum moves and people start saying, oh, what is 40 swap? What is this? What is that? And then they're just ramping into these things. There's probably a good amount more froth. So it would be one of those things where maybe like pull back on some of the positions as they're rocketing up. I wouldn't completely transition out of them right now. I think we're in early innings of Right. Of let, me, crazy let, me, time. Let, let me clarify what I mean by what I said right there. I'm not saying you shouldn't be trading the the altcoins and stuff like that. If you're if you're a uh, more active trader and you're looking for shorter term plays, absolutely continue to trade them. I don't think they're going to hold onto their gains as long as individual trades. I think you're going to get a lot of uh, like meteor showers. I guess yeah, it's true. Like in the in the altcoin biz where some something catches fire one week. And it goes up. And if you, I'm saying, if you, if you're making money doing that, like buying, buying low and selling high in these altcoins or buying these altcoin breakouts, I believe you're a more active trader than most folks. I think that the move is, is to take when you're making profits from these, roll them into the bigger cryptos. You can continue to trade the altcoins as they, as they pop. But I think those pops are going to lead to sharper drops. I think you're going to see a lot more Eiffel Tower type action yep. in the altcoins than you would in say Bitcoin or Ethereum. So just in terms of self-preservation and in building your account, like say you're on Coinbase and trying to you know build up some gains right there, I would say trade the altcoins. And then if you're making money on them, put some of those profits into the bigger stuff and let it ride up there. And I think that's a I think that's a really a, a much more viable strategy than maybe say taking all your profits from one altcoin and spinning them into the next altcoin trade and trying to build that way. I think a, a much more stable way to build uh, your, your crypto trading account would be to, yeah, I think Scott's is saying a good, you know, buy Bitcoin and Ethereum for the long term and then, you know, and then see if you can trade these quicker cycles in these altcoins because there's so many of them. And I do think that the, 
that just due to the nature of it, uh, of the markets, you're going to see much faster up and down moves from the smaller market cap stuff. And then people are going to get bored and they're going to move on to the next thing because there's not a lot of fundamental support for them. Um, yeah. Maybe there maybe there are for some of them, maybe some of them are the next hot thing. I don't know. But if, from a purely trading, trading perspective, I would just assume that that's how that market is going to operate. Yeah. All right. So let's switch gears. Let's talk about, I've heard about this thing. It's like a coin. It's a physical coin. And it, the miners aren't digital. They actually mine dirt and they pull ore out of the ground. And then they make these physical coins. They make them out of gold and silver. It's crazy. I've never, this concept is, is bonkers to me, but it's real. I've gold said. is at all time highs, my friend. Yeah. Look at that. Um, this is a pretty crazy chart. Uh, and a lot of false starts in precious metals. I couldn't stop talking about them back in December. I was or back in November when it was building off the lows and we were all talking about it saying, hey, if if gold can get above 2000 and produce that monthly close, which had never happened and never had a monthly candle close above 2000 before, then I think we're, we have something and we're going somewhere. And then everybody piled into it after that on the first trading day of December. And then they all forgot about it and left. And we got just a bunch of messy chop. Uh, while gold was chopping, all the miners went straight down. So those trades were all dead in the water. And then, as the market loves to do, when no one is paying attention, everybody's paying attention to crypto and MAG7 stocks and NVIDIA and all this other stuff, gold, sneaky breakout right here and pushing up toward those all-time highs. Um, I guess we have to clarify that. I don't think it got above the, the these are. That's a sun. That's the Sunday night magic. Yeah, that's Sunday night. I'm probably, right I'm living on like a close price. Like right. yesterday. I mean, I'm, I'm much more interested. Now. I'm much more interested in like, you know, yeah, some of these closes down around in here. We've definitely had a nice surge. Um, and hopefully things will start to shape up because we've talked about this before. I've talked about this on these calls and on other calls where if you want to be speculating on the long side on precious metals, you need to have the market stacked appropriately. And by that, I mean, silver has to be outpacing gold and the miners have to be outpacing it. So you want to see the more speculative stuff, you know, you want to see silver rocketing higher and it's not quite there yet. It's trying, but you can see how different these charts look. You can see how gold is pushing up here to these highs. Silver is kind of lagging. It's trying to catch back up. It's, put, it's producing some pretty big moves. So it's been catching back up over the past few days. It's kind of consolidating here uh, in the high 23s. But if silver really gets rocking and rolling, then I think we're on to something. And I think some of that money is going to be coming back into the miners. Um, this is GDX. This is the gold miner uh, ETF right here. This is an older line that I had drawn back here from uh, those early October lows saying like, okay, if, if, if it can hold here, then it's good. But if it breaks down below here, it's in big trouble. Well, look at this big thrust, uh, this big impulse move here off of those lows. Just And that was, I mean, this was last week. So this is a brand new move right here off of these lows. And now it's attacking um, these pivot highs from uh, early February right here. I think if we can consolidate here and then push up toward 30, maybe that's the round number because you can see up here, um, all of these failures at 30 right here, and then kind of the false move, November, December, when it first moved up. If GDX can recover here, really push it beyond push beyond 30 and back up toward 31, 32, then I think we're on to something. Um with uh you know a uh a new run potentially for these stocks can put them back in the tradable bucket and say like, okay, maybe the individual miners are going to start looking good again, and we can start picking these things off and trading some calls um, on these. But it's it's pretty exciting, I think, because it's been something we've been watching and waiting for for so long, and it finally looks like it's shaping up. And I like the fact that no one's really talking about it yet, too. I think that tells us that it has some more room to run because everybody's attention is elsewhere at the moment. Great. Yeah. Um, let's see, should we dig into any of the miners specifically or, I mean, any other way, what would be some trades on whether it's gold or silver? Oh, uh, you're asking for specific trades on gold? Yeah, or just something, I'm, I'm trying to think out some tickers. I mean, obviously you've got the, you know, like 
uh, like first majestic silver you've, you've got like some of the specific miners you get into that or do you just stay on those like gdx j i like i like gdx um the problem is that we're really not seeing a lot of the individual miners begin to take off they're still kind of trading as a group i think that if if we do start entering a new bull market for gold and the gold miners then we're going to see some separation but right now they're pretty heavily correlated because they've all been going down this is new mod this is the big boy and you can yeah. see here how terrible it's looked and it's just now trying to get off the bottom right there there's some other ones gold is a good ticker um that looks Eric. a lot better obviously oh nope that's gold itself oh. so there's, there's gold to stock yeah um, barrack is ticker g-o-l-d so i don't know why do it wasn't this. showing this up easier, this is an easier way to do it we can just uh we can just get a list of them right here um so we'll see what's moving today so there are uh, some, and I'm going to take out some of the tinier ones. I'm going to do like mid caps or higher right here. So here's a list of like 15 or 16 decently sized gold miners. A lot of them are tiny right now um, because they've, they've just been beaten into the ground. They've been beaten back into small cap land. But here's a list of some decent sized uh, miners. And you can see some of them are attempting to turn the corner right here. Some of them aren't. Yeah. Um, this is a good looking one. Uh, AEM looks pretty decent. Harmony is a big one. Um, that chart looks pretty decent to me. HMY, that's a nice looking one right there. Uh, so we can we can trade these. I don't think yeah. the options market's going to be super liquid in a lot of them, obviously. But I think there's some decent looking stocks in this group. Uh, a lot of times the premium on the options aren't that bad. I remember like, I don't know, I would trade like Nova Gold all the time, but like some of the, the options premiums aren't too bad if you actually can time out one of those moves. The other thing I'll say, and this is just my own two cents, is that like, just keep it in mind that these miners, when we're looking at them, like this, these are trader, this is for trading. These yeah. are not good long-term investments. You had... um that list up before but barrett gold obviously the ticker is g-o-l-d that was the one that buffett went into i think he went into it at like I don't know, 20 bucks or something it might have gone up to 25 and now it's like it's two years later gold's at all-time highs and it's trading at 15 bucks yep. like that's just you'd be sad if you were a long-term buy and hold on a lot of these because me and gunner were talking about this in the office yesterday <sighs> the mining industry is not that well run like the the oil and gas industry is very well run. They they like profits. They like dividends. So when you're talking about long term investing, just keep an eye out. Um, now this what we're talking about is like oh gold's starting to catch a bid, silver's starting to catch a bid. We start getting some moment momentum in here. These are good for trading. It's just yeah. I don't the long term buy and hold on these things is a little bit scary, especially when you see someone like Buffett get in and then see like see you later. I don't like this business. Yeah, I mean they can they can go nowhere for years, and I mean it's it's not an easy business. It's not an easy business to operate, and they're operating in a lot of uncertainty. They got to get all that ore out of the ground. It's, yeah. it's there's there's a million different pitfalls that come along with the gold mining biz, and so I like to trade them more than anything else. When the timing's good, I'll leave them alone for years and come back to them because they can just go through these terrible cycles. But some of them are are shaping up. Here's Franco Nevada right here. That's a that's an old school name. You probably remember yeah. from the last commodity super cycle that did really well back in like 2005, 2006. Yeah, royalty but company. But it's trying to bottom out right there. So that looks good. Robert mentioned Nugget. So there's ways to trade this stuff uh, with levered ETFs too. Nugget's a 2x gold miner bull uh, ETF, and I believe Dust is the is the opposite. <laughs> yeah. So Dust is the is the bear one. So these are 2x. Obviously, they're going to move double. Um, but again, these are trading vehicles too because you have to deal with you know the degradation of the options and all that that go along with into making these products. So these are not buy and hold instruments yeah. in any stretch of the imagination. These are trading vehicles, and then you know looking at GDX is kind of this is kind of the overarching way that I look at the market and see kind of what's happening uh, with with everything. And this is how I kind of get my gauge as to where we are in the cycle and right now we're trying so it's going to be interesting to see if this totally flips back to a more bullish market um for precious metals uh we i've seen a, a few other steel stocks popping lately i haven't looked at fcx today i don't know what it's doing really so it's still consolidating so there's a lot that kind of needs to happen in this industry before it really pushes us into uh froth mode because the froth is elsewhere i'm just noticing the early, early moves into this rotation type of play right here. And I think there's rotation into other 
areas as well. We just talked about small caps. I think that's going to be a big area where people are going to rotate back into. It's had some fits and starts, but we're just trying to solidify this move in IWM above 200. I think that's the linchpin here because yeah. you can see, I mean, Oof. big time underperformer slaughtered in 2022 nowhere last year worse than nowhere it looked like it was breaking down you know new lows briefly right there right around halloween so this is shaping back up and like i was talking about with bitcoin and ethereum this is another catch-up trade small caps to large caps look at how different and this is going way back in time obviously let's try to pull this back into perspective so this is the past three or three years or so of IWM. Look how much different that looks than, say, large caps. This is S and P five hundred. New highs galore. Been pushing those new highs up, you know, closing the door on that bear market um, since since uh, mid January and hasn't looked back. IWM nowhere close. So I think there's a catch up trade to be made here, and I think that we could be in the midst of a rotation where people are dumping or not necessarily dumping, let's just say taking profits on the high-flying semiconductors, on your lag sevens, on all of these stocks, and then flipping in down the cap scale into smaller cap trades. And I think we're already starting to see the rumblings of this. It's just a matter of, do we get the full rotation into these names? Now, yeah. one of the issues that we have to be keenly aware of is that the lag sevens, those stocks are bullies. The market caps are so big that they really move the averages much more than anything else. I don't know if you've ever seen it, seen uh, days like when, like, like say Apple's down like 5% in a day and everything else is sort of flattish to up in the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ's not going to be up. It's going to be down um, yeah. because Apple's such a bully, um, you know, in the cap weighted index right there. So we're going to have days where the market is down and these rotation trades are up. And it's really great for traders because we have these undercover little bull markets that are kind of bubbling up under the surface that we can chase. And no one really pays attention to them because everybody's so fixated on the fact that, oh, no, NVIDIA is down, you know, um, which is a tragedy because no one's made any money in this stock. Oh, wait, it's gone straight yeah. up for the past two years. Yeah. So, uh, oh, it's down. got to zoom in. Keep zooming yeah. in. Uh, there's there's the down day. I see it. NVIDIA's right down 1%. Top. It's over. So, um, I mean, uh, again mind-boggling strength in these in these semiconductors, semiconductors absolutely insane i thought we were done right here I was, I was like oh man everybody's dumping before earnings no earnings are going to be good enough for nvidia and then look nope up 60 percent and just won't stop so you know <laughs> we can't quick call these things but at the same yeah. time with the people that are vacating um some of these trades today even the stronger ones we just looked at microsoft that doesn't look great. This looks kind of toppy to me. It looks like it might need to retreat all the way back down into the 380s. Uh, we look at Google. Google's had a rough time, had some bad press lately. We talked about this breakdown last week, and we can see it. This was this was when we were on the call last week after that nasty Monday. It's like, ah, I was talking with you about this, Matt. I said, I think Google and Apple are in trouble a little bit here. Yeah. Yeah, I saw someone in the chat. They said they were they were looking. They did some downside action on it. So I know we yeah. mentioned it. It's just one of those things where there wasn't enough going for it to really put the bet on downside. Um, it would have been a little bit gambly. I mean, yeah. I mean, it was one of those things where you're trying to weigh like what the most probable move is going to be in the market. What's really going to give you the momentum? And the problem with some of these is that they can kind of get into these breakdown zones and then institutional buyers. I mean, these are big stocks just come in and scoop them back up on these bounces. So we're going to see where this thing lands. Again, I don't think Google's going to zero, but um, this does look a bit toppy and it does look like, I mean, we could be entering um, a situation where we're in, you know, like three to six months of just ugh, mess with some of these stocks just because they've been so strong lately. Um, Tesla is another one where it looked like it was shaping back up and trying to close this gap didn't look too bad late last week. And that was another reason why I wasn't too keen to get bearish on stuff because, you know, we're in a situation where even Tesla, which has been the worst of the lag sevens um, after that earnings whiff, excuse me, uh, back in January, it's been trying to close that gap and it looked like it might try to, you know, come back here and, and attack the two tens. And then, I mean, yesterday it got absolutely tanked 
down 7%, down another 5% today. So I know it's getting some bad press and press and so there's been some issues with China sales have been low. And then it looks like there's another news story today. Tesla halts production at German factory. So that's not great. Um, it's just in a, it's in a bad news cycle and that happens. Um, again, I don't think Tesla's a zero, but this is not a chart I want to buy right now. Obviously, I think there's better trades out there. <clears throat> One of the issues that we could experience too with some of these um, tech drops is if we look at the heat map right here, we could have down days like this. And unfortunately, think of Apple and Microsoft and Amazon and Tesla, these bigger squares. Think of them as like really big planets with like a lot of gravity. And if they're down, they can suck a lot of other stuff down into a black hole uh, with them. And I think that's what we're, we're seeing today where we have a situation with uh, these mega caps that are getting hit hard and it's and it's crushing the growth stuff. And I've been trying to trade some of the growth stuff on the long side because it it keeps on looking like, and this is ARK Innovation. I use this as kind of like a growth proxy right here. It's been looking like it's been trying to firm up. It's been a sloppy mess right here. You can see the dancing all around 50, where it breaks out above 50, and then it goes back down. And then it's been getting tighter and tighter. But these are still kind of wild trading stocks. There's a lot of them look kind of ugly out there. We've been trying to play square on the long side right here and tried to get in on a quick break above 80. This is in uh, the trading desk where we tried to get some calls right here. And we're getting we're getting eating down here back into this gap right here. I don't like the way this looks. And this is just, I'm afraid it's just getting sucked down with everything else right here. If it bounces here and actually gets some traction um, later today and, and closes above where this gap is, then I'm okay with it. But right now, I'm a little bit nervous about this trade because if we're in a situation where people start dumping tech and then it just sort of goes down to this stuff that was setting up and looking really good, like it was going to break out, then I think we have some cause for concern, maybe a quick rug pull on the entire market. Um, yeah, if it tries to fill this gap, I think I think our trade's in trouble. We have plenty of time on it since we're looking at April strikes right here. But at the same time, I don't want to get bogged down in it. If, we're, if it's cut in half for us right now, which it probably is, I haven't looked at it in the past 45 minutes right here, then we're going to be in a situation where we want to just cut the trade and then move on to something else. That's just trading. That's how it goes. So we'll see how it goes. But those are those are some of the things we have to sort of be aware of. We could have a situation where we just the market just spins and we rotate into some of the growthier stuff and we're fine. Or we can have a situation where people get a little bit more nervous because SMCI and NVIDIA are down and then the MAG7 are down and then people start getting concerned and they start selling off all the other stuff in tech too and we get a bit of a rug pull. So we'll see if yeah. that's the case. We don't know just yet. This is just one day. So we don't know if this trend is going to continue right here because you guys know if you've been following along and you've been trading on a day-to-day -day basis so far this year, we'll have days where Apple's down 3%, Microsoft's down, Tesla's down, and then the next day they're all up 3% and everything else is down. So we have these kind of flip-flop trading days where people are trying to sort of get their bearings. So we'll see how this sort of, uh, how this develops moving forward. Yeah. Um, a few things to fill in the gaps there too. Um, we're into March here and it's important to keep an eye on it. Um, I think NVIDIA has got a big conference coming up the week of the 18th. I think they might be like 18th through the 21st. So that could start getting headlines. You got to keep an eye on it. Like that could just get some hype going. If you're trying to play the downside of something, you probably don't want to run into a four day NVIDIA hype conference um, with, with the semis. And the other thing that's happening that week as well. So that should be an interesting one is on the 20th. That's the FOMC meeting, uh, rate, high, uh, rate cut not expected at all. But when you look at the percentages, I think I saw them yesterday. I think the percentage for a rate cut um, in by the time we get to June is like still 65%. So we'll see how that all unfolds. But that goes right back to, if you're talking Russell 2000, the reason the Russell 2000 is not at highs like the S&P is because of rates. They can't get the credit. They're different little animals and they have been struggling with you know two years of you know if they need to get a loan uh, they ain't getting the cheap money that they were getting before and those companies live on those those loans so if we can see a cut or two the russell could be off to the races that's what's yeah. going to make it outperform and that's like a uh i'll have to share it with the group but there's some you know plenty of studies on that similar to we had a bunch of momentum going in um into 2022 once you get three 
rate hikes, the market gets affected. And we saw that all throughout 2022. On the opposite side, once you get two cuts in a row, that's when most likely I would look at small caps. That's when they start moving. Yeah, and you can keep in mind too that the Russell is very, um, it's built a lot differently. It's not as tech heavy as as the major averages. It's very bank heavy. So you got to look at like what regional banks are doing. These smaller banks, they make up a good chunk of the Russell 2000. They're firming up today, um, but this has been a rough, a, a, a rough ride for these stocks to say the least, just due to like yeah. all the great stuff. There's you know? nothing in my body that would make me want to buy a regional bank. Again, maybe that's <laughs> the contrarian play. Uh, similar, we were talking about China last week where I'm like, oh, there's nothing in my body that makes me want to buy China. Right, but yeah. regional banks, like you get into like, again, we someone was mentioning Jim Rickards about crypto and stuff. But if you get into Jim Rickards thesis and you start thinking about like, what does the government want to do? Well, they probably want to control where your money is. And it's way easier to do it with fewer banks. Like, I don't think they have incentive to keep all these little regional banks healthy. So yeah. I there's just so much stuff setting up there. I don't like it. There's but, China um, right here. And we talk, you, you just mentioned China. Um, and we were talking about this bounce off the lows, and it doesn't seem to want to hold those either. So China's, uh, this bottom yeah. bouncer is not looking too great. And again, like, this is a market that's been a total disaster and is well below its COVID crash lows. Um, and yeah, it might have been a good trade to try to pick the bottom here on this bounce, but I don't see any, I don't see any positive follow through um, just yet on China large caps. And so, yeah, that's a no touch for me as well. There's other, there's better stuff out there is what it comes down to. Yeah. Um, you just have to watch out for some of these plays right here because everybody's always quick to quick to talk to call these turns in the market. So we have a situation where we see this initial bounce off of these 2022 lows right here. And everybody's like, that's it. This is going to be a big impulse move, bear market over. Here it goes. Same thing happens in the opposite end on something like NVIDIA, where we have um, you know, a meltdown like this right here, where people say, all right, you know, like this is uh look at this beautiful drawing. Um I like that. I didn't know you had that capability, dude. Yeah, I, I barely do. It's tough to really draw with the mouse. But you can see here, like these drawdowns are can be quick and then you can get brutalized. I know this was an earnings move. But this can happen whether there's earnings or not on some of these high flying stocks where you have these resets and then people are quick calling the end of this rally. Everyone wants to call turning points in the market. There's fewer turning points than you think there are. We're usually somewhere you know, along a trend. We're not necessarily at a bottom or a top. We're just along the road getting to somewhere. Turning points are rare in the market. And so I'm, I'm not saying that you shouldn't play downside moves like this. I'm just saying that you better be quick about it and take those profits when you can get them um, because you don't know when you're going to get a rip in the, in the direction of the primary trend. And right now the primary trend, despite the fact that this is insanely overextended, the primary trend is higher. So we have to respect that on these stocks. And until we see that change, then that's the market we're in right now. Even if we do rotate away from these for a while, this could consolidate for an entire year. And I don't think it would hurt. The, I don't think it would hurt the stock at all. Um, you know, and I think, you know, yeah. looking looking throughout the market right here and looking at these semiconductors, you look at something like SMCI just added to the S&P 500. I think it joins the S&P 500 on the 20th or something, the 22nd of this month. So little bells like that tend to go off in my head. Something being added to an index, is that the peak of the hype right there? I'm not saying it's time to go out and short the hell out of this thing. But I am saying that maybe, maybe that is going to be the event where everybody who has wanted to buy has bought, and then it levels off and gives back some, or whatever else might happen. Obviously, still going straight up right now, but you can imagine how a big announcement like that could kind of be the peak, or at least a short-term top for a stock that's just gone straight up, literally straight up. I mean, what are the year-to-date gains on SMCI? 260 percent on the year it's march it's the beginning of march we've had two full months of trading that's it this yeah. thing is this thing is going far and beyond I, I and i know i know there's been a big value reset on the idea of what this company is worth i get it it's still a lot it's still a, it's still a giant move so yeah. what it is. 
Um, Brad wrote, and he was talking about the uh, regional banks being a percentage of the Russell. I mean, that's true. I think I just looked up the stat. It's like regional banks account for 18% of the Russell. The thing is, what I'm saying is I'm I'm talking two different ways, right? I'm talking arguably conspiracy theory about regional banks and controlling of our money. And then, I mean, cuts in rates help regional banks. So I believe we're going to start seeing cuts. So that still would help the Russell. And again, it's if it's 18%. Um, even if some of those things fall out of bed or if a couple go belly up, we'll see what happens. But, uh, you know, rate cuts are going to make the Russell rock and roll, I think. Robert asked a good question here that says, what if we go sideways for the next five to six months? What to do that? Well, I don't think everything is going to go sideways. Um, I think that uh, I think if the market, if the averages go yeah. sideways, there's still going to be trades on the long and the short side. I think we're still going to see groups that are retreating. I think we're still going to see groups that are rallying. If we we could very much have a small cap rally and it go completely unnoticed in the S and P and the Nasdaq, uh, it just you know it's just a different animal. What if we have a situation where uh, stocks take a hit and we have uh, energy breaking out and we have oil actually doing something? You know, I I've been saying that this looks like. It's trying to do something here. Buyers kept on coming in, buying WTI down here in the high 60s, and now we're pushing up to 80. Nobody's talking about this yet. And a lot of these, uh, a lot of the midstream stuff is firming up. A lot of the EMPs are firming up. There's some interesting looking charts out there. I don't think they're necessarily buy, buy, buy right now just yet, but I think this could be the beginning of a nice rally in oil right here, a nice seasonal rally into the spring why not why not have oil uh back in the high 90s right here uh, we don't necessarily even need a catalyst we what we need is we just need it to build and to maybe creep above 80 to the point where people start noticing because no one's been talking about oil for some time now uh we got a decent rally late last summer that totally fizzled in the high 90s and it looked like who's oil's going back down to negative but yeah. nope. So and that's one like you could you could put on some of those buy and hold investments because again, unlike the gold and silver miners, I do think the oil companies are well run and they pay a dividend. So you could sit in something like that. Again, it's not gonna be a swing trade, but you could sit in the, some of the big guys that pay a nice dividend, ride 20 bucks up in oil um, if it goes that way. And the other thing that we could get, again, these things are all connected, but if you get a little bit of weakness in the dollar. Um, you start seeing the dollar poke towards 99 or hundred, right? You like, that's, that's, what's going to give, maybe you get a little supply and demand plus dollar weakness. That's the recipe for $90 crude. Yeah. I mean, it's entirely possible. I'm, um, I'm just going by sector here. Uh, I've arranged these stocks, by so we got, this is, uh, all, all stock, all mid caps and higher that are zero to three percent below their 50-day highs and there's quite the list of energy stocks right here uh there is uh chk that's a good looking one um yeah so it's a nat gas yeah this is a nat gas play that's been firming up a little bit so that's decent looking um what else uh cve it's a smaller one that looks pretty decent uh ctra looks good it's a nice looking chart so there are going to be plays in this sector that start popping up. Um, I think Fang got bought, didn't it? Yeah, that's the thing, dude. All the all the tickers that like I like to trade. A lot of times, they end up just getting bought out. Like, so you got Fang, you got PXD. There were some decent traders. I mean, PXD was big, but you can see how messy it's been. This is this is Occidental. This is the one Buffett's in. But you can see how messy and sideways it's been. If this thing gets traction and gets back above. 67 it can go to the top of its range and then we see what happens um but this is obviously covid back here uh this is negative crude territory when it was eight bucks but you can see how it's attempting to shape up and it's off of its lows right there again these aren't the most beautiful charts in the world but they're starting to shape up uh pxd is another decent looking one uh, but i think it's worth keeping them on watch right here and you can see them creeping up off their lows right here look at this one pioneer Nice series of uh, of higher lows coming into this year, and yeah, but those are the guys they did they got bought. Highs. 
you know, it seems like this period, whatever this was, is over. You know, if we want to get, I would say right there, you know, so this medium term downdraft is over and now it's building off of there. And then we'll see if it gets back into the 250s right there. I mean, obviously there's a lot of slack, some sloppy charts right there, but I think we can see some trades in oil. I mean, again, it all, this is all dependent upon the price action and, and how things shape up in the markets. But if crude keeps yeah. on inching higher, I think, I think these stocks are going to firm up. I think if we look and again, at Exxon, just, uh, I think I said it a second ago, but Exxon bought, like they merged with PXD. So like there's whatever's happening there that happened in late 2023. Um, yeah. They were, they were the best acreage holder um, by my estimate in the Permian and a Exxon knew what they were doing. They're like, Oh, we're yeah. going to get them while oils at 70 bucks. We're going to go in and buy you guys. So, yeah. And again, it, it's possible that this doesn't happen. I'm just trying to prepare myself for a bigger rotation in the markets right here. And you can see how different the sectors look. You can see looking at this, it's kind of been, this chart's been a sloppy mess since going back to the beginning of 2023. Um, it looks a lot different than say XLK, the tech sector right here. Totally different. Um, totally different looks right there. So if you're in the camp, where you're thinking that like, ah, XLK, long in the tooth. This needs to chill out. This needs to go down a little bit. Maybe it passes the baton to energy. Maybe it passes the baton to precious metals. Maybe it's small caps. We'll see where the momentum goes. I think it's going to yeah. go somewhere. I don't, think we're, I don't think we're in the end of something in this market. I think we're in the middle. I think that there's too much positive under the surface of this market to say that like, oh, because things are so frothy in some of the biggest tech names that we're headed for a, like a like the end of a bull market, the end of a crash. The market looked terrible back in October. We've been inching our way out of that 2022 bear market for a while now, and it's just now starting to catch. I think we're early in the bull cycle, I, but I do think a lot of that stuff is going to need to rest and we're just going to need to move on to other names. And I think the hot money's got to go somewhere. Why not here? So yep. that's what I have my eye on in the week ahead and in the weeks ahead. And I'll do one more. Again, this is more contrarian conspiracy. Don't connect it with how I personally trade, right? Because I'm still going to be in and out of the markets, but I keep this in my head. We are in an election year. We had a solar flare take out cell phones. Like <laughs> there's some wars going on around the world. This is also a year to keep your head on a swivel. Like the charts, uh, and the charts normally know a lot of stuff, right? But the charts might wake up one night and something wacky is going on. So it's uh, this is another time where I'm I'm keeping my 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 wits about me and keeping my finger on trades that I can get in and out of pretty quickly and not putting too much exposure in there in the long term. Like I don't want any six months trades on right now because. Mm -hmm. You could just run into a buzzsaw and something wacky. With, well, uh, I mean, with I will election. say this. I'm not going to disagree with you, but I will say that it is possible that the news cycle turns a little more sour, um, especially when it comes to things like oil. I don't think that there's been enough talk about the threats in the Middle East and everything happening in the Red Sea. I think that's been very much on the back burner. and. I think that could potentially be one of the catalysts. And I think, again, you know how I think, Matt, but I'm going to explain yeah. to everybody else. Price leads the news in my mind. So if we start to see oil start to move higher, and if we start to see light crude go from um, you know, the 70s into the 80s and then into the 90s, that type of move can change, can change the narrative. And it can force the media to focus on like, okay, so why is this going up? Maybe we need to look more into what's happening in the Red Sea. Maybe we need to talk about that more. And then that can all snowball onto itself. That happens all the time where these financial journalists have to sort of be pushed in that direction because they're, they're not talking about it. Then all of a sudden they have to because the prices are changing. And so <laughs> therefore they need to get on it and start talking about those things. I think it's entirely possible that that's the type yeah. of environment we, we end up in if if prices continue to push higher right there. Yeah. Yeah. And if we wake up overnight and the surprise and the, the shock is something like you're saying, it's a war in the Middle East or some other piece there. Yeah. Then oil is going to be the trade because we got a bunch of it here in the U.S. and it's safe. 
Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of different things. The good part is top trades every Tuesday, 11 AM. We'll be back next week with, uh, who knows what's going to be happening by then. And we've got, like I said, a lot of stuff shaping up in March and video conference. Uh, the 13th is the, uh, uh, Ethereum Denkun thing. We got an Ethereum ETF at some point in time. You get the Bitcoin having in April. This is a, a fiery time. So uh, it's a good time to, to be tuning in on Tuesdays. We appreciate all the participation. I said it in the chat. Um, Gunner, I'll echo the, the comments there. Um, thanks so much for your time and your knowledge in this space because it's nice to have that grounding. And we know not every trade works out, but we want to put ourselves in the best shot um for upside and i think you do that great here at top trades and the trading desk so everyone thanks for tuning in gunner we appreciate it man we'll see you next time yep talk to you guys later see ya